Hey there, believers. I got a great episode for you this week. Today, I'm bringing on Adam. He and his wife, Allison, are the founders of the Stone Rosary Company uh, located in Canada. You can see these beautiful rosaries behind me. Uh, for those of you watching, uh, I've also made a little video of them on TikTok and uh, Instagram as well. Beautiful work. Uh, great craftsmanship. They, uh, uh, Adam felt it led to send those to me and let me know that they were on the way. And he didn't know this and no one else on earth knew this other than my wife that I had been looking for a rosary. Um, he said in a message that he knows I was dealing with spiritual warfare, um, pretty much on the regular as, as part of, you know, the mission. And he just felt compelled to to make these beautiful rosaries and send them to me. Um, he made one. He actually wound up making two for me, and he made one for my wife too, as well as um, you know, smaller ones to keep on you. Um, just again, very kind gesture, very beautiful work, and powerful. You know, um, the power of prayer. And spiritual warfare is amazing. Um, all right, so so he sent these to me, and we start, you know, we struck up conversations. And as we talked, I discovered that he's had several experiences of his own. And we're going to bring him on the show today to discuss his experiences and experiences in his family. What I hope to get into, um depending on how much time we have his um he's got information about a, a yeti encounter he's got information about a uh, a fairy experience that someone in the family or a friend of the family had um his great grandmother met the devil i hear a lot of stuff along these lines here where i'm from um, so it, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's, it's, um, uh, it's right up my alley. You know, I, I love to, to discuss this stuff because of the reality of what we deal with. And I don't know. I just, uh, I look forward to this conversation and there's more. I'm, I'm not going to say everything right here, just in case we don't get into everything because unlike smart people, I record my intros before the conversation. And I don't know if you know this little trade secret. Most of the intros are done post-production. Uh, it's people write down their summary and then they tell you what the show's about. And then they let you hear the show. I kind of shoot from the hip. Always have. Um, there's a handful of times that I've said what's going on after the fact on an intro. Most of the time I, I cold lead into it. Don't talk a whole lot about the experiences with the guest. And then when we get on here, it's all just more authentic and genuine. And I'm hearing it the first time as you hear it. I love it that way. Okay. So if you want to come on the show, if you have an experience you'd like to share, please holler at me. It's the bump podcast at gmail.com. Or you can call the bump phone. Leave me a voicemail or a text. Very seldom, but sometimes I answer it. Sometimes I lose my phone. Um, but I have a number dedicated just to the show and it's 304-812-0553 call it anytime leave a voicemail leave a text message and i will get back to you um the most reliable way is usually email i check that eighty thousand times a day uh, if you leave me a message on social media like facebook messenger or tiktok or instagram i will see it but it might take a few days but i will see it so just however you want to get a hold of me, I appreciate it. And I look forward to sharing your story with the world too. Um, if you want to support the show, as you mostly know by now, Patreon has been shut down uh, for as far as my show goes. I just felt led to not put anything behind a paywall anymore. Um, but if you want to support the show, if you feel like you want to do that, 
um, you can you can go to the app. It's called Buy Me a Coffee. There's a link on the show notes. Uh, just buymeacoffee.com slash the bump podcast. And you can just like I said, you can send the money to buy me a coffee. Uh, there's different tier levels. You know, you can you can send as much as you want. You can sign up for a monthly subscription, I believe. It's just so it automatically just did you know deducts X amount of money from your account. So you don't have to worry about it. But I just think that's a an easy way to support the show without any kind of obligations. Um, and, you know, that way I can put all the content out without having to be like, if you want more, you have to pay for it. I'm just going to put it out there and I'm just going to trust that those that want to support the show still will. So that's where that's at. So buymeacoffee.com forward slash debump podcast. I'm pretty sure there's a way to subscribe on uh, Spotify for podcasters as well, because I, I have some of you that do that, and I greatly appreciate that support. Um, so, yeah, full-length videos will be going on YouTube uh, instead of just a Patreon. And as always, every pod podcast platform out there, as far as I know, this show is on it. So I hope you listen. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you participate, you know, answer some Q&A. Um, if I do some lives in the future, holler at me on the lives and just uh, continue to listen. And I'm, I'm sorry about the ads, but I try to put them all up front too. So you can just get to the, to the show and not be interrupted anymore beyond that. All right. I think that's everything. Oh, um, just in case we get tied up and forget to mention it later, you can get a hold of Adam and his company. If you were if you are interested in a rosary or want to see his work, he as he is on social media like Instagram and Facebook at Stone S T O N E Rosary Co. Okay, all one word, Stone Rosary Co. You can also reach him at www.stonerosaryco.ca. Like I said, they're coming out of Canada and they're just dealing with a big storm up there. So hopefully our service won't be interrupted, but let's go ahead and bring Adam on now. All right. You got the, the got it notification. Got it, sir. All right, brother. Adam, thank you so much for coming on the show. Like I said, I've already done the introduction, so let's just get straight into it. Um, right. where do you want to start at? Uh, I guess we can start with my, uh, my Nan phrases, uh, stories. Awesome. Um, that have been passed down to me. I've kind of become somehow the family treasurer of these things. I think it was just because I was interested in them. Um, everyone's got to forgive me too. If I talk a little fast, um, uh, that's the way we speak here. Our dialect, we have a bit of an accent kind of sounds Irish in a way. And we're fast speakers. So slow me down if you have to, Bo. You're good. Um, so my, my grandmother phrase, um, they had a cabin uh, in a place called Mars. Um, M-A-H-E-R-S, like the name. I always say because everyone's like Mars, what a strange name for a place. But nothing to do with the planet. <laughs> um, so... It was very, up until 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, there wasn't even power lines up there. Uh, it was very rural. It was just a place where people had cabins built. Um, few people lived there uh, all year round. Um, but some people did. Uh, so one night when my... Uh, grandmother was up there uh there was always stories of fairies um she had one experience herself uh, where my mom actually witnessed it when she was a little girl when i was six or seven years old they were walking up through the path with their sisters and my nan had a bun in her hand they were going up to the neighbors um it was dark out just a dusk summertime kind of thing Anyway, she had this bun 
I don't know if it was like a T-bone or a scone or something. But uh, she was walking along, and all of a sudden she said, oh, where'd it go? My mom said, what? She said, my bun. She said, it just literally disappeared from my hand. Wow. My mom was like, what? And she said, and I was like, it must be the fairies. Like, my nan was so nonchalant about this kind of thing. Like, she was just like, she had like no fear of the supernatural for whatever reason. And, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's one of the stories where she just, oh, the bun disappeared. My mom says she'll never forget because she was terrified. Yeah. Um, she'd never seen anything, literally, bun disappeared from hand. Well, is, anything is, is, is fairy lore part of the, you know, the thing there? Like, you're in Canada, right? So, yeah. Are fairies so, popular? Fairies are pretty popular. I don't know if I think it's because it comes from a Celtic, like mainly like a Celtic tradition, and there's a lot of Irish influence here. And so you'll find, but there's there's many different types of fairies. Um, well, I mean, you know this, but here I'm just speaking for Newfoundland yeah. lore. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, Newfoundland is the most east coast uh, province of Canada. It's the most easterly point in North America. Um, it's the old St. John's is actually the oldest established city in North America, not just Canada, but North America. Um, very old, a lot of history. Um, a lot of it's a big province, big island, but just lots of woods. There's only 500,000 people who live here in the province. Um, half of those are in the capital city. So all these rural areas are just like thick. I mean, like thick, dense forest, so thick you can't even walk through half of it. Like you'd have to bushwhack like it's a jungle. Like boreal forest, the trees are a foot apart, you know? Um, so it probably wouldn't be the greatest place for a lot of uh, Bigfoot creatures to live, but <laughs> they'd have a hard time getting around with their size. <laughs> um, but anyway, see, I'm getting off track again. No, you're good, you're good. Um, so back to uh, the fairy lore, but yeah, so we have a, a lot of Irish settlement here. Um, another interesting little tidbit, I will say, uh, there's a Lansom Meadows, uh, a place called Lansom Meadows. It's French, forgive me for the pronunciation of that. Um, it's on the northwest coast. Uh, it's a Viking settlement. Uh, so it was a, a Viking tribe of Leif Erikson came here in the 900s AD, okay. so way before Columbus, way before John Cabot, way before any of the European explorers. These guys were here. Um, it looked like they were here for the berries, actually, to make certain types of wines and jams and things with. Uh, the berries here are known to be very good for that. But anyway. Interesting little tidbit. A lot of Irish lore. Um, fairies being a, a massive part of that. You have stories of fairies that are tiny little lights that fly around. You have stories of fairies that are two foot tall little people that devour children. Um, you have stories of fairies that are actually almost the size of regular people, but are just grotesque kind of witch type entities that live uh in solitude or in groups around these things called fairy trees and fairy circles so we have the fairy circles we have the fairy trees um but yeah the lore always dif differs from from place to place you go so one thing that you'll find common throughout the whole area though with any type of fairy is that the way to repel these fairies are to give them gifts right um or like you either you carry up torn up pieces of scripture in your pocket um you can wear pieces of clothing inside out to confuse them hmm. somehow that works i don't know um the other thing is keep breadcrumbs around in your pocket because apparently they like bread which is funny because like as a Christian, you know yourself, the reference to bread. Right. If these things are some type of evil or fallen entity, and, uh, you know, there, there, there's some that seem to be evil, there's some that seem to be mischievous. 
there might be some that are trying to get back in the grace of God, and that's why they 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 for whatever reason want bread. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just something that popped in my mind. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's kind of like what makes me lead what led my man to believe okay well it must be a fairy i didn't see it it disappeared it's not here on the ground anywhere like it would be right here there's no way right. a coyote came up and snatched it out of my hand or a bird or you know like it literally just it was there one second gone the next so that's an interesting one now the main one that my man would always tell and this is something that's going to be known and established too my uncles and my grandfather would always like to jazz up stories and try make up stories and try to scare us. Right. My man actually they didn't like that. She hated when they did that. She would always say to him, stop calling up the kids and I stop that. But when she sat down and told a story, you took it as this is the truth because if it was false, she would be like, that's, you made that up. Right. So that's not real much. Tell them an actual ghost story. Stop filling mm. their heads with nonsense. Tell them an actual story. So she would always tell this story of uh, a woman she knew. I'll leave her name out. Um, but uh, she was a good friend of hers. Um, I believe I've been told that this took place uh, like pretty long ago. So probably in like the, the 40s, 50s kind of thing. Um, there was no running water. So if you were washing dishes or whatnot, you would have to fill up the water from the well, wash your dishes, and then throw the water out. You know, so she was out on the patio about to throw out this bucket of water when she's seen all these strange little lights flying around. They're almost kind of dancing. And she was kind of found it odd because, you know, one would think that, okay, this is fireflies. This is an insect but we don't have any type of luminescent insects here. Like we're, we're an island. Our biodiversity, I guess, is not that wild. Like a lot of things were introduced here. Moose were introduced here. Here we were introduced here, you know? Yeah. Uh, we don't have, we don't have any type of snakes here. Um, so all that stuff was kind of introduced. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> forgive me, I got something in my throat. You're good. <laughs> Back to the store. Hmm. She uh, she said, for whatever reason, she felt compelled to throw the water over these lights. I guess she got a negative feeling from them. Like I said, I don't. I, I've never been able to ask her questions about it. I can't ask my nan questions about it as she's not with us anymore. So I'm kind of left to get a general idea of maybe what was going through her mind. Right. Um, she threw the water over the lights. One of them came over immediately. Like they, they changed their position from being, oh, dancing little things to, okay, now what's going on? We're being attacked. She could hear like a giggling, kind of like a mischievous kind of noise. And one came over pricked her thumb, well, kind of like landed on her thumb and then flew away. And she was like, maybe it was some kind of insect. Maybe it was something that was, that's new here. Okay. So she doesn't think much of it. Goes to bed. She wakes up the next morning and her thumb is swollen like the size of her fist. Oh, wow. It's absolutely like ballooned up. And it felt really strange. She said it felt really heavy, like there was lead in it. And, uh, you know, which it would, I mean, if, you're, if your thumb was filled with fluid or something. Yeah, I'd imagine. So she goes to the doctor. I don't know exactly what happens with the doctor, but he decides that he has to probe it or drain it. He's like, it's, it's weird, right? And I'm thinking this is probably before, like, when x-rays and stuff were still really expensive, you didn't just go into an x-ray machine, so they I guess they cut it open. I guess he cut it open to drain it. And he started to pull things out of it. And I just started pulling out was a bunch of colorful, multicolored feathers and straw. What? Very bizarre. Multicolored 
feathers and straw, and it's almost filled with this. And you're just pulling it out, pulling it out, and pulling it out, and pulling it out. Wow. And sewed her back up, her thumb went back to normal. It's like a hex. Yeah. It's like Yeah, she very. Uh, man, that is crazy. Oh man. And I would I imagine this is a pretty long time ago, right? So there's so nobody kept the feathers, nobody kept the straw. They're probably just weirded out and just get rid of that junk. Yeah, like I said, I don't, like, I know that this woman came around afterwards and, you know, like, told my nan about it, and, Really, what you know, she said? so she, you know, she came, she said, the strangest thing happened, you know, told my nan the whole story, that's what I recount, and, um, that was, that, uh, whatever happened to her after, apparently she, like, went on to live a normal life, nothing else strange ever happened, um, But my nan always said it was the fairies, just nonchalantly like, yeah, that's kind of normal. That's just what fairies do, right? They just <laughs> stick feathers in your thumb. Man, yeah. that's, that's wild. That is wild. See, I've seen stuff where people get cursed or whatever, um, and it gets into like hoodoo or voodoo down, you know, like, I don't, I don't want to be wrong, but like in Haiti or whatever. And, you know, people wind up like, they do some kind of thing with an egg or whatever and they break the egg and there'll be some kind of uh, nasty junk in there or somebody will throw up and it'll be like nails and horse hair or something, you know, it's like these, these objects that shouldn't be there are there. And it sounds like, but it was inside of her thumb where she was touched Yeah. by this, this light or this creature. That's, I've never heard anything like that before, man. You've, And the detail I noticed about it that's strange, another strange thing is that she said it felt extremely heavy, like it was filled with lead. But what they pulled out was things that were extremely weightless. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I don't know why, but it's just a strange, it's a strange thing. It's like, I wonder why. Yeah. I find fairies amazing creatures, whatever they are, because they're so bizarre. You know? That is interesting. Man, now this is a, uh, is it the same? Nan is it the same grandma, or was it her mother that said that they encountered the devil? Ah, so that one, that was her mother. Her mother, So okay. it would be my Okay. great grandmother. So the story goes. She, they owned a farm of some sort, um, and they used to run this little store out of this farm. This is in rural Newfoundland. It's in the middle of nowhere. You know, people don't just travel through, you, especially not in the nighttime, especially not in bad weather. There's one way at this point to get across the island, that's by train, and that's it. Um, so she would provide eggs and little things like this to the people in the community. So it would be strange if strangers were to come in. So one night, as far as I understand, the, the weather is pretty bad. Um, our weather is very unpredictable. You'll get a forecast and then two days before and then all of a sudden it'll change from rain to snow and it's a snowstorm it's very unpredictable um so this man comes in in this bad weather and apparently the story goes he was charming looking yet you got this very dark feeling from him he was dressed the way a normal gentleman would be dressed in those times this would have I would have to estimate this being maybe like the, the 20s, 1920s, 100 years ago now. Um, he came in and she said the strange thing was he had no protection from the elements, but he wasn't wet. And all she could smell was like sulfur, like a real strong smell of like, and not just like he had been around a fire or something like, like, 
she said the pure disgusting brimstone and salt he said he came up and he asked her a couple questions and he asked for a pack of matches she sold him the matches um, and he you know nodded at her turned around and walked out and when he did she said he, uh, when he turned around and she looked down he was dragging a cloven hoof behind him now I don't know what that means is another thing I can't ask details about because they're not here I don't know if that means dragging a cloven hoof meaning one of his feet where it was a cloven hoof yeah, and he was he was like kind of just click clacking along. I don't know, or if he had like a, a some type of demonic, uh, you know, like a trinket, some type of like a cut off goat's paw that's cursed or something, and he had it attached to him. I don't know. Yeah, right. But either way, that he was dragging a cloven hoof. And she said that was when this overwhelming feeling came over her that it's like this, whoever he is, he's from the depths of hell. It might even be Satan himself. She swears that it, to this, to the day she died, that it was the devil himself. Mm. From what I remember, I think that the family might have been going through a death at the time or something like that. They may have been vulnerable. Kind of would have made sense, I guess, in yeah. her mind anyway. Um. But yeah, that's like I said, I, I, I called my mom on it. My mom was talking about it. And she was trying to pull up any any details that that she could remember more of, right? But that's that's about as far as we got. And how intense is that? You know Yeah, it's it's very strange because like it's like it's not like, you know, there's an after part where okay, this guy comes back and does something or Right. Hey, I'm letting you know I'm here. Yeah. It's tough. Weird. Yeah. The, just the reality of it. Mm. And all the classics too, right? Uh, he's this handsome man. You know, he's not affected by the elements going on outside. This strong stench of sulfur. But you, what what's interesting is like, despite that overwhelming smell, you still can't help but notice how charming he is. You know, once a time if something reeks, you'd be like, man, just get out of here. But it that detail of he must have been that handsome, you know? Yeah. But then when he walks out, I imagine if he's dragging a cloven hoof, I imagine it being attached to his body. Like he's dragging that leg behind him. I don't know. Um, that's that's the impression that I got is that it was it was it was part of him. And that's yeah. what sh shook her like to the core and was like okay, like the bad feeling that was kind of lingering I got from him, like she had this feeling that, okay, maybe his charmingness is a mm. facade. This guy's greasy in a way. He's going to do something, you know? Yeah. And she said, but it, it was strange because, like, you know, it looked like he was well-dressed too, you know? But it, it's funny too because a lot of these uh, Luciferian stereotypical notions like that come from, like, movies and kind of later popular culture like this is in the 1920s in rural Newfoundland like I don't even know if she could read you know right. what I mean yeah so like I have no idea and, right? and you know, and plus where do you think pop culture pop culture gets the references uh, you know it is from encounter experiences they didn't just come mm -hmm. up with him being an, an evil charmer and you know suave and the smell of sulfur that, that all comes from stories like this, you know, and then they just put yeah. it up on the big screen. Uh, wow. And so not, nothing else happened afterward. He just let her know that he's around. Yeah. It was after doing a lot of thinking about it and trying to like, after diving into the space of hybrid creatures and all this weird kind of Nephilim stuff, um, it makes me wonder, was it some kind of uh, entity that was in the area along, like not the devil himself, but just some type of entity. And he was there a lot longer than 
their farm had been there and this town had been there and all this is kind of newly established as he's saying hey like what do you think you're doing coming in here on the turf you know i don't know there could have just been a personal thing right no idea i wish i could ask <laughs> yeah man for real wow all right where do we go from here uh I'm, I'm going to leave it open to you, but wherever you want to take it, I do have a couple other topics I wanted to get into, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure. But uh, you you want me to just keep popping off questions, or do you want to, do you have somewhere you want to go with it? It's completely up to you, man, but I can I can say another quick one. Uh, sure. My nan always swore to to us that this was true, that her and my grandfather we're walking late one night up the train track uh, at Mars and they heard a train coming. They seen the light, heard the whistle, heard everything. So they moved off to the side as they normally do. Wind rushes past them, horn blows, nothing, absolutely nothing there. And both of them swear like, no, a train passed us, but it wasn't there. What <laughs> ghost train? Yeah, and like I like where do like these weird ghost train stories come from? But mm -hmm. yeah, so I don't. But that was one that she always told. Like I said, as if you know, like she was like, "This is true," you know, like because she would tell you, like when it wasn't true, she was like, "No, nah, your uncle made that up." Like they would always tell stories of these things. Terrifies his children. These little green men that were made of glass. And we used to be terrified of it. Um, so I tried to ask my aunts about that. And they were like, no, like that was just made up. <laughs> Trump just, <laughs> just made that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I have the pleasure um, of being an uncle and I get to make up tales. Mine aren't as creative as little green men made of glass, but I have a, a seven-year-old niece and I convinced her that there were these two men that live under the porch of her grandmother's house. <laughs> and she was like what are their names so i just started riffing man i was like oh it's bill and ted and she's like bill and ted she's like why are they here i said well i'll tell you what they're on this excellent adventure and you know and i just i had her outside at night i, I promise you Adam, i had her outside at night screaming party on dude and just trying to see if they would say anything back to her <laughs> <laughs> oh my, that is hilarious but it's not as original as green glass man you know <laughs> and, and they, they called them like the harco chisels and we were like that sounded so scary and apparently like the harco chisel was like a chisel that is the brand harco like a like you know it's just a tool that was like you know one of the uncles was like what were we were like what were they called they must have looked over and seen a harco chisel and like all oh, the harco chisels you know? yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh but we took it as gospel truth until until everyone told us the difference you know of course um, now are these uh, the same yeah. uncles are these the same uncles that told you the yeti story one of them yeah so there is there was more from what i know people in the area have recounted seeing a white yeti like creature in the area that's just what we were always told. It seemed to be a thing that if you brought it up to other people, they would know what you were talking about. Now, we always had a name on it to kind of give it like a not scariness called white woolly. Um, I guess our parents would tell us that to make it not scary because like our uncles would try to terrorize us with it in a way that they would go out on the side of the cabin and scrape the side of the cabin and, you know, make noises and stuff. But my uncle did say that one night he was there because he, he owned a farm. He was one of the few people who did live in this area year round because he was one of the few people that had a store and a farm. Only small, not like a big farm. There's a few chickens, a duck pond, three and a half, uh, you know, uh, barns, you know, a little small chicken coop, and a couple pigs. That's it. Um, but he would have trouble with lynx, with coyotes, until every now and then there would be more damage done than what it seemed to be. 
Mm. It's going to be something bigger, you know, and he would never think anything of it because he wasn't scared of anything. He's the type of person that would wrestle a shark, you know. Um, now, like I said, mind you, in the evening time, he'd probably have a scattered drink on the weekends when, when the stuff was going down, right? Mm. Um, so we, we don't know exactly what, what, was, <laughs> what was legit and what was not. But he swears that one night he shot at it. And he he's he he says I think he hit it, but there was no evidence of him hitting it. Like he thinks like whatever it was, it went through it, right? But mm-hmm. not like physically, you know. Like it must have been a spiritual entity of sorts. But now, mm-hmm. what leads me to the other only evidence I have of this creature is when I was about, I can't, maybe 10, 11-ish, like, like preteen, enough that I can really remember very vividly, but still being in the kid's mind state. Um, I was with my older cousin. He was pro- he was the same age as my sister, so about six years older than me. So he was probably, you know, 16, 17, 18. Um, and me and him... And his mother, my aunt, and my mom, we were all walking up the train track. This is an abandoned train track at this point, right? This train track shut down in like the 70s or 80s. Um, so it was always just a road after that. And beautiful scenery along the way. Everyone's cabins were along the way. So you'd go walk up this. You'd say hi to your neighbors. Beautiful area. Um so we're walking up through, and me and my cousin are a little bit ahead of everyone because we're little boys. We're all, you know, he's a bit older, but we're, you know, playing Dragon Ball Z or something, you know. Right. And uh, next thing you know, we see one of the corner lots has this big tree uh, in the in the front yard, and it kind of uh, like wise out into two large trunks. Um, and people who own the house or the cabin and their neighbors are all out stood around this tree and we're kind of like what's up? what's going on up there and like let's go say hello and we go and look and there's a massive moose hide like so you're a hunter you know the size of a, yeah. a whole moose um the hide is wrapped like it looks like as if someone one big moose hide and one piece and just threw it across the tree and it just stuck to it kind of on its branches and stuff, you know? Wow. And when we went over, what's going on? They were like, they looked extremely concerned because they didn't know where it come from. And I think that the guy who lived there was maybe like taking it as a threat or something like from someone else in the area maybe or whatever. But when my cousin went over and he got closer and looked at it, he came back and he said, I don't want to go look at it. It, was like, it looked like it was torn. You know, it doesn't look like someone had cut it in clean cuts. It looked yeah. like it was it was ripped. You can't rip a moose hide unless you're a yeti. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would take the Incredible Hulk to, to rip a moose hide off of a body. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, so and like that is in burn in my mind. Like I'll never forget that. You yeah. know, so like that's one that I'm going like, yeah, could it have been someone did something? Yeah, but it just doesn't make sense. So mm. like every, everyone knows each other. There's probably like sixty people in the whole community there at this point. You know, like so it, it just wouldn't make any sense. Um, but yeah, so that that was another weird one. So that that that's kind of the the Nan phrase, um, Mars area that my mom's side of the family stores. Man, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I I imagine that image would be burned in your mind forever. Uh, a moose? That's that's not like a deer. That's not even like an elk. This is like the body of a car being up in a, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's this huge. is like, like, and now, now it, it was 
uh, it was just the the, just the, the skin of the animal. Yeah, yeah. just like, but I, I mean, like that thing. I can only imagine how much that weighed. Right. Yeah. For real. And for that to be removed so, from the body completely, and it was like it was like it probably wasn't the full hide, but it was like I just remember being like, because I think as a kid at that point I'd never seen a moose in real life up close. I've only seen videos. I'd only seen them far away, maybe crossing yeah. the street. But we used to have a massive moose population here, and we still do on the central and west parts of the island, but in the east coast, they're after being hunted down a lot now. So you don't see them too much anymore than when I was growing up. So to see the sheer size of such a thing, it was just like, what is happening? Yeah, that's incredible. And, and, and so people thought, oh, well, it had to have been like a bear. We do have black bears here. We don't have grizzlies. We do have black bears, but not many. And they're usually pretty low key and they wouldn't kill a moose, you know, like they're small little black bears. Even a group of them probably wouldn't attack a moose. And if they did, you would notice evidence on the hide of claw marks All and right. teeth marks. And this was, looked like a giant to this. Right. <laughs> Maybe it did. <laughs> Maybe it did. Exactly. Maybe it had nothing to do with the Yeti. Maybe it was Jim the Giant with the road. I don't know. <laughs> hey, speaking of giants, and this is way off topic, have you been keeping up with what's going on in, uh, it's all over TikTok anyway, uh, in Miami, Florida, here in the States, there this experience in a mall, have you heard about this? I've been seeing blips of it. I've seen you comment on something about it. I've been meaning to get the story, but just yeah. haven't had a chance yet. So, but all I know is that there was, uh, it seems to be something that's like barely being reported on. I've seen a guy who, I don't know if it was real or not, but it was a guy who his dad is like running for mayor or sheriff of Miami or something. And he calls him and asks him about it. And he's like, I can't talk about it. What? I haven't seen yeah, that so, so I'll try to find that and I'll send it to you. Yeah, man. I don't know if it's legit or not. I haven't had a chance to really, really look at it, you know? Yeah, I've I've heard really just one eyewitness story, um, and it's supposedly he was there. Um, but, yeah, it's down here, it, it, it's all the way down in Miami. At this mall, I guess they're, they're thinking that it's built over a portal or a portal was opened, and these seven to ten foot tall creatures – we're going through the mall trying to get to people. And, you know, what we do, we pull firearms and people start shooting back at these creatures and running and freaking out. The official report as to what happened in this mall is there was four or five teenagers that got into a fight with sticks. Okay. Um, somebody mentioned that they had fireworks. Fair enough. But the police response, there were 60 to 70 squad cars that showed up, surrounded this whole mall. Lights on, uh, black like SWAT helicopters flying over. Big response to a handful of teenagers with fireworks and sticks. So everybody's trying to figure it out. But this guy I saw on there, he told this story, and he talked real crude and crass. I didn't really care for that. But... uh the what he was basically saying, if I paraphrase it, was he was with his girlfriend and they were shopping. And then people started screaming and shots started firing. So they decided to run. And as he's looking around, he sees these creatures. He said they looked almost like shadows. Um, And the way this guy was talking, he doesn't seem like the type of person that's really into the paranormal, you know. But his experience, he said that these shadows would like morph into these huge seven, eight foot tall entities. He said, look demonic and they would surge forward and then they disappear and then they'd reappear closer. He said like they were trying to chase them down, but they were popping in and out. And he said, they just, you know, him and his girlfriend just hammered down running through around people and got out of there. Um, but, you know, I haven't heard any other stories and there is little to no video evidence but in his defense, he said 
that he's he's seeing people asking about videos and he said who would have their mod on their phone when something like this is actually happening to you yeah it makes it almost kind of more compelling in a way that is like it's not being being pushed it kind of seems like it is kind of being don't let this get out you know and plus there's not much of it anyway maybe and suppress it now i don't know who they are but you know like um right uh it like you said it makes me wonder it makes me wonder it's funny because i had this conversation with a priest recently similar conversation that it feels like there's something coming you know and i think that every christian has felt that way since the beginning of you know Christ's ascension in heaven that the world is going to end in the next minute. It's kind of part of our, it's it is part of our theology, you know. But it seems like in, in the time of when all that was going on with you know the, the Mayan end of the calendar, twenty twelve, that kind of time. Like I wonder, is there some kind of veil break or yeah. something? That that there's something breaking, or maybe it's CERN, or maybe or maybe it's all these things. I have no idea. I just love to think about it. Give yeah, me too. But man. he, he, you know, the, the priest kind of. He said, "Like I, I feel like uh, he said, like I'm getting kind of the feeling that, like, I wonder, will, will he was thinking like me, like saying to me, like, will you see in your lifetime like a complete persecution of the church, you know, like a full, gone underground movement of the church." Yeah, he's like, I, I, I don't know why, like, feel like that, you know, and and it makes me wonder, is is that what's happening? Is this just the beginning of, of some type of veil? Like, you think about those aliens in Peru. Yep. Like all this stuff is like, to me, it's not your average Roswell crash, uh, light sighting, um, kind of thing. It's weird. It's, it's almost too weird to be made up, right. you know, like this random little tribe in, in the jungle and people that look like the green goblin. Like, what? Like, well, what is that? There's a lot more believable things to make up that are that, you know, and there doesn't seem to be any goal to obtain out of it. So, like, where's the conspiracy, you know? So I take it as these are just people seeing what they saw. Now, what they saw is up for speculation. You know, but the same thing with the Miami stuff. Like, I, I wonder, is it that, or is this some type of coordinated um, uh, project? Uh, what's 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 the why does that slip my mind right now? The project Blue Beam. <laughs> yeah, like you know, fake hologram type stuff. Well, maybe it is the real deal, but it's just like coordinated in a way that it's like warming people up to some type of large-scale event like, a, like an I mean, look at less than a year ago out in las vegas nevada there was a ufo crash in somebody's property and somebody catches on security footage like security cam footage of what looks like this eight or nine foot tall being hiding behind this uh, privacy fence and it's it's insane like is that cgi is that ai i don't i don't know but it's the way it moves and looks and how all these these three stories in particular come together. Um, I don't know. There, I think there's definitely something going on. I think we both know that it says that when the end comes, it'll be like the days of Noah. And what were the days of Noah? On top of all the depravity and everything that was going on, giants, Nephilim, hybrid creatures, uh fairies yeah <laughs> yeah mm. we choke yeah. yeah no for sure some something man something yeah but i don't know i could be completely wrong i'm open to anything I, i'm there pretty open to it too now uh the your area is known for something right um the bell island boom some kind of crazy phenomenon that happened in the seventies. Yeah, so Bell Island boom. A uh, little bit of background about Bell Island. 
uh, and my connection to it. It's about a half hour commute from St. John's, the capital city where I live in. Um, it's just this tiny island. Uh, I can't even give you a square kilometer, but you can drive around the entire thing in 20 minutes. You know, like you can walk around it in a day easy. Um, it's basically a solid chunk of iron in the middle of the bay. Um, iron ore mines started there. Oh, geez, I don't know the exact dates that they started. Um, but they were shut down in the in the 60s, I believe, the late 60s. Um, they were used greatly during the war effort. Like we used to, Bell Island used to send a lot of raw iron ore uh, over to, well, a lot of times they'd send it to America to be processed and then shipped over to Britain for the war effort. Um, there's actually off the coast uh, of Lentz Cove on Bell Island. Uh, it used to be a popular unloading area for iron ore to load the ships, unload and load the ships. Um, there's two, there's a couple shipwrecks there. Um, when I was a kid, you used to still be able to see them, the masts stuck up out of the water. Um, they've since cut those off for safety purposes, people parasailing and things in the area. Um, but you can actually go on a guided tour uh, if you're a diver, if you have your credentials, you can go on a guided tour down to the shipwreck. Um, there were two iron ore. Uh, I think it might have been in total, like around half a dozen ships were sank. And there's still U-boats down there. Um, I remember being a kid, they found actually a, uh, a torpedo stuck on the side of the island that must have missed a boat that was like, potentially could still blow up so there's like a big deal about it you know <laughs> um but so yeah so bell island is it was a it was a very busy work center for quite a while it attracted a lot of cultures it was like romanian people british people irish people americans like people from all over the world um came here to work in the iron ore industry um i believe there was well, of course, there there's eight, eight mines or so uh, that go like kilometers deep. Like you can go down in one of these, you can go on a tour and all of them are shut down because they've all been flooded. Right. Um, but there's still one that they have open. You can go down, I think it's like a kilometer and a half or so deep. Um, and then all of a sudden you come to this ledge and it's just water and you can hear the ocean, you know. Um, but it's known as one of, I think it's the most haunted island in North America. I know in Canada, um, I know that for a fact, uh, many, many stories come out of there. And I think like a big part of it comes with, you know, the mixed cultures that were there at the time. There's so many different lures arriving from all over the world. But uh, the Bell Island boom is a, is a strange one in particular because this doesn't even seem to be anything uh, more so on the spiritual level. This seems to be more on the technological kind of side. But mm. um, basically, it was April 2nd, uh, 1978. Um, there were reports of a really bad explosion from like up to places 65 kilometers away across Conception Bay. So this bay, Conception Bay, is almost like a a horseshoe um, like this, and Bell Island is kind of right in the center of it. So on both sides of this whole peninsula, you heard everyone all in town hear this massive boom. You even had some people who were just looking out their window, and they seen like a, uh, say like a 45 degree angle ray of light shoot at the island from the sky. It's the island, and there's a a really loud boom. So one guy's testimony, um, Edward Bennett, uh, some of my dad knew, like my dad knows all these people, you know, like my grandmother was there. She remembers the boom. She was on the other side of the island from where the boom seemed to happen, but she remembered it, you know, no sweat. Um, it was a big deal for the time. Yeah. Because the other thing too, this is the height of the Cold War and stuff. 
you know, that's what makes me think it's something technological. But big explosion heard from 65 kilometers away. This guy, Edward Bennett, sitting down at his table. And he's sitting down at his table. And there's an outlet there that he has his radio plugged into. And uh, fire, like blue electrical arcs, just shoot out of it. Um, about 18 inches, he said. He's, he's bang on about it. He said, after the fire shoots out, right after, big boom, he said. Uh, balls of fire came out of ovens, TV sets exploding, motors just burned out all over the area, all over the world. Oh, uh, there, was a, there was an old clock that hadn't, an old mechanical clock, a non-electronic clock that hadn't worked in years, not even wound up, started going crazy. Ding, 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 ding. Okay. Um, motors burned out. Um, now, the, this is one of the interesting things. There was multiple reports of um, one comes from particular from a young boy. Uh, I didn't write his name down. My bad. But you can watch the documentary. Anyone who wants to watch the documentary, it's on YouTube. And it's like an old one. It's kind of hard to watch. It's like staticky. It looks like it's something out of VHS, but I mean, it's a 70. Um, uh, but there was three buildings hit by something and multiple people like this little boy uh, witnessed uh, orbs, orb sightings. And these were about three feet in diameter, blue with a little bit of orange around the edge with looked like uh, what well, was sparks shooting out of it? So something almost uh, uh, like an electrical phenomenon. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm thinking. It's like an EMP, like there's like an electromagnetic pulse or something, some kind of targeted energy. Yeah, this is insane. And he said it it moved, moved in front of him, I think, and then it just kind of like disappeared, vanished as soon as it came. Um. But there was one particular area that was the most interesting. Um, it was in the area of Lance Cove. I actually had my dad. Remember when I sent you pictures? We were over there. I had dad bring me over and show me the area where it was and whatnot. There's nothing there now. Uh, someone's property. You can't go on there. But um, there's three buildings that, that seemed to be hit by something. Uh, a barn blew apart, but there was no burn marks. The chickens were dead and bleeding from their eyes and mouth, but with no burn marks. Then they found three depressions very close to this same barn. Apparently, there was fuses from the old fuse panels found in, in outside that had shot out of fuse panels through the walls, multiple walls like bullets of houses, and ended up outside or or stuck in the walls or wherever. Um, but uh, there was three three depressions. Uh, one was like a rabbit hole on top, and then there was two more about four feet across from each other. So almost like a triangle. Yeah. With three holes. About, and the whole thing was about four feet, you know, in size. Um, apparently, scientists, you know, studied the soil and everything. Like, it just seemed to be a lightning strike of sorts. Now, one of the things is there was absolutely not a cloud in the sky this day. Um, meteorologists from all of there, there seemed to be a great interest all of a sudden days after this right like i said i got a few more points here yeah and so right before the boom some people heard some kind of strange reson resonance like a tone before the boom right before like seconds before so it's like boom you know that tells me a lot of things. Um, but so this was very heavily studied. It attracted a huge amount of attention, specifically because Newfoundland 
and Belle Island being a strategic and resourceful location during the war. The, so we made an, we made a deal essentially at, at World War II when the Americans entered the war. Everyone was desperate. You know, Canada depleted all its resources, sending it to Britain. So the Americans were like, well, let's like, we'll hook you up, but we want to be able to, like, this is a really good location strategically. Right. Um, we'd like to set up, we'd like to use one of your bases for like the next 99 years. That was the contract, right? They're like, sure, like, we don't mind. So it was like kind of great, really, because we had a lot of Americans here that brought businesses and culture and married a lot of our women and intermingled with the society you know created a lot of families a lot of jobs and it's really good in, in the long run because it was kind of like a great depression era you know here a lot of the men were killed in the war um but there was talks of actually uh you know i guess the Russians always may have wondered, do, do they have an actual base here? So I think that where there was so much interest and in the time that it was the volatile time, the Cold War, you had like Canadian military, you had a lot of American, you had guys in black coats showing up everywhere, right? Essentially all over this small little island of 10,000 people, you know? And everyone was kind of like, what is going on? You know, this was like the FBI and like all these military agents, all these scientists came from all over the globe, you know, and studying the soil and studying this because it just none of it made any sense. What they ended up, it, it never has been fully concluded as to what it was, but they like to say that it was some kind of probably rare weather phenomenon mixed with a rare lightning phenomenon at the same time, coincidentally, even though there was no clouds. Um, but I don't know, I'm not a meteorologist, but there was, an, I got a few points here. There was enough electrical energy dispersed in a fraction of a second. So in a couple milliseconds, there was enough power to power the city of Montreal, Canada. So I, like, that's a pretty big city. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Montreal, but it's a pretty big city, yeah. um, for six hours. Wow. Um, there was a lot of scientists came from New Mexico and New York in particular. Huh. Right, you know what kind of bases are there. Huh. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Dr. McDonald. Um, he's kind of like, uh, he was kind of like one of those people who was like a more, took a more eccentric, like he's really genius kind of person, did lots of good science work, respected in the community, but was kind of always out there, you know. But he had the idea that he considered it might have been some type of device triggering electrical waves that affect human behavior. And what happened was the boom was unexpected because they weren't expecting the island to be a solid chunk of iron and it magnetically messed with their, maybe they were testing this as some type of weapon over the ocean. Maybe they were testing it on the people in Newfoundland. Maybe they were just experimenting with whatever, and the iron ore pulled the beam when it wasn't supposed to. Maybe they were, uh oh, you know, or maybe it was another country, and maybe the Americans really were, and Canadians really greatly concerned about is this some type of attack, you know, it's from a space weapon or something, but. The weird thing about it is, is the whole orb phenomenon, right? That's the one that the, the like, like the, as soon as they explain away one part, that interferes with another part, you know? It's yep. like, okay, well, maybe it was ball lightning. It's like, well, yeah, but this doesn't make sense because of what people saw with the big white light and everything, right? Yeah. It's like, well, if it was... A weapon why was it tested here in the first place you know and it's like well maybe it wasn't meant to maybe it was magnetically pulled there maybe it was supposed to just go in the water you know who knows maybe it was a misfire maybe it wasn't even a weapon maybe it was some type of uh uh other type of uh, weather manipulating device
place, like a harp system or something that that just was moving a weather system or something. And and again, the iron ore messed with them. I don't, I don't know. But there's so many. There's, like I said, you have to go watch the, the, the all the listeners. You have to go watch the documentary. There's a few on it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's a weird one because, like I said, there was nothing really ever conclusive about it. It's still considered a mystery to this day. They say they know okay as lightning phenomenon, but you can't tell me exactly what happened, right? You know, like it's like you want to explain it away, but like no one's telling me exactly what happened. Well, give me like I'm not a scientist or anything. You can't even give me a layman's, you know. Oh, Maybe it was a ball of lightning that just uh, you didn't see and uh, just appeared and poop. It's like, right. you gotta give me something better than that, you know? Right. Three extremely improbable things happening all at once, and that still doesn't even explain half the other stuff that happened. No. Know? Um. But yeah, like like I said, it was the, the, the other thing too. There was a lot of um. This was just after the first flights of the Concorde, right? Uh, of the planes breaking the sound barrier and whatnot. So there was all kinds of testing like that going on prior to this. But this has been scientifically, it hasn't been shown what it was, but there's things that have been shown what it's not. And it's definitely not plane testing because there's too much electrical phenomenon. Um, it was more than just a boom. It was more than just a sound. And what's what's reported by all the people isn't your average uh, boom story, you right. know, uh, where where you have these weird noises. And like, I don't know. I've yet to with all the podcasts, like you know, you and other creatures, Prometheus Wind and stuff. I hear talks of it, but I haven't found. And maybe it's around. I don't know. Maybe you could tell me even a real deep dive into uh, the phenomenon of, of weird noises, like the humming. You ever hear that? Yeah. You know, like there's a place, uh, it, it's like by Niagara Falls, and uh, the, the residents are terrorized with this strange humming, this tone that's in the ear constantly, and it'll go away and it'll drive people to the point of insanity. You know, and maybe they thought it was Zug Island, this island across from Detroit. Or in the, across the river over in Detroit, where there's a lot of manufacturing, maybe it's a machine. And they went and did all these tests around. It's like, no, like it's not coming from here. Like, you know, these strange tones. Yeah. No, I don't. Yeah, have... it makes me wonder if it was if it was the beginning of those kind of things. You know, it may have been. And you know, this, I I don't have anybody that's come on the show to talk about the hum, but there are several locations and incidents of that kind of stuff. So if anybody listening, that's, I don't know, already figured it out, or maybe you're retired and have a little bit of downtime. If you want to dig into the, the bell Island mystery or these, these mysterious homes and these resonances, I would love to have them on the show to talk about it. Um, there was another, cause, cause another thing I know too, uh, I believe, there was a similar incident that happened. Um, it was on the eastern seaboard somewhere. Like, I don't know how close to West Virginia it was, but uh, it, it, it was somewhere on the eastern, northeastern side of the states that it occurred, I think, like a little bit before. And I, I, I'll, I'll find it for you, Bo, the, the name of the, of the, the town and whatnot that uh but it was the same kind of deal it was like a small town you know and loud boom and yeah strange electrical phenomenon i think it was only like kind of you know it was around the same time frame and they passed it off as the concord flights but like i said the electrical the, the flights had stopped at this point and uh it, it doesn't explain the lightning bolt yeah. No, no, it don't. Um, which wasn't even like you know the thing is too is they said well maybe it was super lightning, you know, and super lightning it happens so fast, human brain doesn't even have time to react to it. All right. I can't see super lightning being a complete 
perfectly 45 degree white ray of light. Right. You know, if yeah. there's no incidents of people reporting that or people seeing a flash, you know, or or nothing at all even, it, it would kind of make more sense. But uh, to see if, to me, when you see an angle like that, yeah. that only means one thing, you know. Well, see, man, someone operating it. Yeah, and this isn't that long ago. This is forty-five years ago. The, so there's yeah. got to be plenty of witnesses still around, willing to talk. You know. Yeah. So um, my dad was alive at the time, but unfortunately, he was away in schooling in Ontario. Yeah. So he remembers speaking with my nan about it. Like my nan, as soon as he, you know, called her that evening or whatever, like he normally did, she said, the strangest thing happened, Bob. Like big loud noise and you know there's people here investigating and we, um but yeah like i said it's, it's no surprise really though at the end of the day that it happened to bell island because i don't know like i said i'm not something to do with iron i don't know if it's a ley line thing i don't know if it's a but a people brought it there thing but it, it's a lot of supernatural stuff going on and you know what? I'll try to put you. I've been trying to get. I'm going to try to get in touch with uh, Henry, a um, uh, gentleman who was a mayor over there, Bill for a little bit, I think, or like ran for mayor. Actually, I shouldn't even say that because I'm not sure if that's true. Um, but he's someone who's like a very uh, devout lore keeper, you know. So yeah. he handles all all the islands tourism things. He gives all the tours to the. To documentaries that come here to do documentaries about it and you know it was on creepy canada and stuff and he's always the, the go-to guy who you go to for the lore you know so i've been dying to have a chat with this guy I mean, he's been yeah, so man. busy you know there's you so know. much similarity between where you're at and where out where i live here in west virginia um i know that they're both like rural communities and they're they both have uh mining you know, industries, you know, with iron ore and, and coal mines down here. But we both have a strong Irish culture um, in both areas. And it's just so weird. The woods and hunting. And yeah. And that yeah. Kind of... If you step off the main road here, you're in the woods. I mean, mm -hmm. It's just period. That's it. You're in the woods. There's there's no, like we have a, a capital. We have some cities, but they're not out of eyesight of just woods. <laughs> you know what I mean? No matter where you're at, that's just what it is. Yeah. And uh, we are thick with weird too, man. Um, You talk about this Bell Island, how it was all of a sudden ridden with uh, all these black suits and, you know, scientists and all this stuff. We had the same stuff going on here, like the men in black with with uh, the Mothman and the UFO flap that went around that. And that was just yeah. like 67 and the Flatwoods monster FBI, the military come in and they give you this stupid answer. Like, oh, you saw an owl in a tree. What? Yeah, and they, they 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 treat us like we're dumb. But mm -hmm. it, we're not dumb. You, you know what I mean? Like. I, I just, like I'm, 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 I'm open to, to it all. Like I like to hear, okay, maybe it could be this, maybe, yeah, maybe it could be that. But like, I feel like a lot of times, like your intuition will just be like, uh, ah, something out there. Right. Yeah. If it feels wrong, it's probably yeah. wrong. And I yeah. Just, the, are like the are mouth, these man. Kind of, you know, all these kind of phenomena are they attracted to us? You know, I, I say us loosely. I'm talking like, is and it, it kind of could be connected to like bloodlines, maybe. Um, yeah, or some type of generational attachment or. Yeah, something like something David Pilates. Miles. If you're familiar with uh, David Pilates' work with Missing 411, he has found. Mm, yeah. A little bit. Found, yeah, that, that most of the time, these missing cases, it's tied to people of Germanic bloodlines. Weird. But it's just something that's a a, a a thread that runs through the whole thing. And over here, we have this Celtic culture, you know, from 100 years ago, 150 years ago, whenever they settled in. But we we have this fey lore. We have these weird things that everybody's just trying to like, uh, just shut up. You didn't see that. Uh, 
And it's just like so prevalent in our culture. And like, it becomes a part of who we are, you know, um, no matter what the origin is, who knows where that light come from that hit Bell Island. I would love to get to the bottom of that. Um, it's just, it's just odd. It just strikes me as odd. There's something, there's some kind of connection here between Newfoundland and Appalachia. Like I can, I can, it feels like there's some kind of connection there. It's like, a, it's like, a, yeah, it's like, a, it's like I said, I don't know if maybe they followed, followed us on the boats there. Right. Or is it, or is it does distance not matter? Is it just, does it just follow the people? Right. Uh, it, it was that the, the type of entities that were originally assigned to be our watchers. Yep. And we just, you know, as people from uh, bloodlines come from Ireland and whatnot, that there are watchers and they just follow us and they're after falling. Some of them are trying to get good graces back, even though they know they can't. And some are not. Some are just terrorizing. And I'll tell you one thing. I remember uh, when I was a kid, I would have these weird dreams of these two red eyes in the sky watching me, you know, and I always felt evil. And uh, it was definitely not God. Like it was something spiritual. Yeah. Like it wasn't like a UFO or something, but it definitely wasn't God. It definitely wasn't something malevolent, but I don't think it was anything that was there to particularly hurt me. But I would have these nightmares about it. And it always, um, it always gave the impression, like this deep down feeling that whatever this was is something to the region that that's here. Yeah. You know, and I can't explain it. It's just weird dreams of a kid, but you know, yeah. Does that makes sense though, man. Um, I, that nightmare just brought one up out of, out of to my memory that I had, you know, I don't think about it very often, but I, I had recurring dreams of a man, I guess it was a man, but he would be perched. We had a glider on the front porch. I, I don't know if you know, I, like these metal gliders, it's kind of like a chair that just swung back and forth kind of deal. But in my dream, he would perch on the arm of that glider and just stare through the front door, the glass of the front door. But he was like, his body would like kind of glow white, but he had like, in my mind, he had, you could see like his beard and his hair were black and his eyes, there was something about his eyes, but he would just stare through that door at me. And uh, it's that feeling of being watched, man. Um, yeah. And like, there's no escape, you know, no. like it was like, I went in a building, it seemed what building I went in. Right. It was like, so it was like this, this weird that it was like, okay, there's these, uh, these things out there that don't want the best for you. Um, that it seems like they can't hurt you for whatever reason, but be careful because they'll try to if they can. Yes. That was the vibe I got from the dream. It's like there was some guardian angel or something, like yeah. kind of giving me some type of emotional, uh, information from the soul, like, you know, you're a little kid. You're protected by God and his angels for now. For now. Be careful of the things in the future. If you open yourself up, these evil things will consume you, you know. Hmm. I got, that's just a vibe I got now after, obviously. That's a, that's a, a hindsight lens right. that I put on it, you know, obviously. But it is what it is. I think that a lot of times, like, God speaks to people in different ways. With me, it seems to be um, very subtly over long periods of time. I'll do something one day or I'll see something and just click and I'll go, oh my gosh, this is a concept that God's trying to communicate with me for. You know, it's using, using examples from my childhood and different dreams I've had experiences with people and it just made a concept make sense to me. I can't even give any example. Just happens all the time you know yeah. is you can see the bigger picture of things or, or the god in something you know yeah absolutely. and uh it happens to me but I, I i went off track again so no 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 i don't know because it it actually leads to only have like one or two questions left and it kind of that went straight into where i was wanting to take this um you messaged me man 
uh, it's been probably two months ago at this point. And yeah, so, it was quite a while ago now. Time goes you, past. Man. Yeah, and you had already mailed out a rosary. And you, you messaged me and you said that you felt it on your heart, you know, like the Lord wanted you to send this. Uh, and that, that yeah. just goes right into what you're talking about. Like God leads you and he gives you nuggets, you know, and I thank God for your obedience to him. Um, but what, what led, I, how did he do that? What led you to, to give me this rose, this beautiful and very functional, I, I told you off air, <laughs> very <laughs> effective uh rosary uh so the whole rosary thing um you know i've been making them about a year now or so give or take very ser more so very seriously since say eight months ago or so i'm doing it like multiple ones every day now i'm just completely addicted to it you know i have way too many my wife is like you got to start moving those. So <laughs> I've been giving a lot of and stuff because at the, at the end of the day, I don't, I have a love for making the rosary and, and of the rosary. I don't, it's like I sell them just enough so I can continue making them. You know, um, we like to, any profits we make give back in some sort of way. This year we did it with the food bank. Um, but with you in particular, um, I had been listening Blurry Creatures, your podcast, um, a whole bunch of podcasts in that realm. But for whatever reason, there's something about you that always stuck out and I can't even tell you why. I think it might be, um, the, the vibe I get of your openness for truth and not just saying it, not just saying it's like, Oh, I have this worldview and this is my worldview and I'll accept any other truth. And, you know, consider it. It seems like with you, it's like all you really care about is what is true. And like, you don't look at, I don't know. It's the vibe I get. And when I was listening uh, and you had on, uh, I can't remember what episode was it, um, but it was the one with, uh, you had a friar on, correct? Was it a friar? Yeah, yeah. And I was praying the rosary that night, and I can't even tell you, I had, I had just listened to that episode, and I thought to myself, I was like, you know, that Poe guy, he, like, he seems like such a genuine fella, you know, like just a real truth seeker, lover of the Lord, like, you know, top notch kind of, kind of in, in, investigator, just like the way my mind works. Like, I just want to hear about it. Like, we'll figure out the details later. Let's see what grains of truth we can get from all of this, you know, and, and, and what direction it points in. But I just had this overwhelming kind of feeling that it was just like it was almost like a, it's kind of hard to put words on because it is just a feeling and I, I hate using terminology like God said to me or because it almost makes you like I don't want people to come off as like oh I directly communicate with God and he tells me things that are audible because it's not like that it's just like feelings you know and right. it's like it's not like anything else I can tell when it's my own mind and I can tell when it comes from somewhere else and this one came from somewhere else and I just felt like things I had been reading and listening to at the moment and then when I heard your podcast with the friar um I felt like it was the blessed mother was just like give him a rosary because for whatever reason maybe it sounds bad because it's kind of like I'm trying to convert you to a Catholic you know I but you, it was almost like she was like my son wants him 
you know, and forgive my uh, way of speaking in that way because, uh, uh, you know, like I said, a lot of people are like finicky about Miri and stuff, but, uh, you know, I'm, I've become a very big Marian theology guy. And yeah. I used to be very anti and I've like done like a, a Paul kind of thing, you know, where it's like, I used to like despise that, like no Christ only. And it still is Christ only. Don't get me wrong. Right. But understanding Mary's role and how she relates to the church. Yes. And since like I've seen, like I've opened myself up to that, there's been this more closeness that I've ever had with God. And like I said, for whatever reason, I can't tell you why, it was just almost like a notion that it was just like, give him a rosary because either A, he needs it because there are things coming for him. And two, I said A first, didn't I? It's like Ricky from Trailer Park Boys. First of all, and C, <laughs> but, but first of all, I think it was. I'm kind of thinking out loud now too, so so don't uh, trip up on it. But it was like one thing was like, okay, Bo needs this for spiritual protection because of the the the, the type of topics that he's learning about is one, and two. Uh, the fullness that is experienced in the, in in the, the the relationship to Christ through praying the rosary i believe is something that wanted to be given to you cuz like i love it so much man i want to share it with everyone and, and like i feel weird cuz like some people are like you know even like anglicans are very close to catholic but they're still they're not about the rosary you know, I was like, no, I don't want, I don't want your beads, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So like, I was like, I have a feeling that if I send this guy beads, he will really appreciate it. He will use it. And for whatever reason, he needs it. So that was just what I went with. And I said, it's funny because then on that episode, you gave out your PO box number and everything. <laughs> and I was like, same thing. There's no such thing as coincidences. I just throw that out the window right away. But it's always subtle things. It's never these big revelations where it's like, you have to do this or whatever. And sometimes it is. Sometimes it's like you get this, this pull in this direction. And this was kind of like one post. It was like, it was very clear that I was to communicate with you for some reason. And maybe the rosary was just a tool to allow us to meet or whatever maybe. you know maybe but i i truly don't believe that because i like i live for the world it's, right it's, well look i'm so grateful that you did it um like i told you the only other person that knew this was my wife that i had been looking for the right rosary for like a year um, <laughs> when you I told me that i was just like yeah, man. Now I got to send him an even better one. Because <laughs> what I had sent was so late. It was just acrylic beads, right? And I was like, I don't know how, I've never sent one to the States. I don't know how expensive it's going to be. And then, like, when I sent it, it was like nothing. I was like, oh, okay, like, I got to send this guy a glass one, man. <laughs> my, my grandmother, who was devout Catholic, um, she passed away a few years ago. And for whatever reason, you know, the last year, I've been feeling this pull, like you need to get one of her rosaries, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to bring it up because it's still, you know, it's not that long ago that she passed and I don't want to ask her sons, Hey, Hey, what not you give me? You know, I, I didn't want to do that. If it would have yeah, just, just came to me, that would have been one thing, but it didn't. But I was just like, I need something of, I need it. And I need it to be special. I need this value. You know, I need it to have this value. And you're like, man, I'm, I felt led by God to send you this rosary and it's already been blessed. And I'm like, Oh, there it is. You know? Oh my goodness. <laughs> and yeah, I, I get that the people have a fear of, of rosaries. It's not worshiping Mary. There's a difference between uh, veneration and reverence as opposed to worship. Huge 
gigantic difference. Pick up a dictionary. It's not the same thing. While uh, we're on the topic, if I can say so. Yeah. One of the things that changed my mind, and like I'm not going to try to change anyone's mind. Right. What I like to do is let scripture change your mind. And I'm not going to give you scripture verses. All I'm going to say is anyone who is genuinely interested in why Catholics have the perspective of Mary as they do, it's not only scriptural and biblical, but it's not even New Testamental. It's Old Testament stuff. And you can go dig into that. There's plenty of resources. Scott Han is a good one. Um, where he gives, uh, uh, you know, plenty of, of, of scriptural bases into why. And, and in short, it's, it's thy queen stood at thy right hand is the concept of, of the Jewish, uh, leader, the Jewish king of Israel always had his mother as the queen because they had multiple wives. So instead of selecting one wife as queen, your mother was queen. And people usually, in most cases, unless you were very close with the king, you went to the queen first. Um, that's a basically a quick uh, general. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't go to Christ. It doesn't mean Catholics don't go to Christ. It doesn't mean that there's no other way um, because Jesus is the only way. It's just that he, I believe he wants to, you to live in the fullness of his family and experience the love of his mother in the way that he did now that when we go to heaven, we're not dead. You know, right. the saints aren't dead. Mary's not dead. They're more alive than we are in mm -hmm. the presence of Christ. So we can ask them to pray for us and hopefully one day we'll get to sit with them and have a dinner, you know, and that's basically it. It's your family. That's it. They, I, I, that's, that's and perfect. Jesus wants he, he He came here to be, a family with us to bring us into that family. He wants you to experience that as, as he did with his earthly life here with his mother. You know, he wants you to experience that as well. I believe that's what I believe as a Catholic. That's what the church teaches. Um, but it's not a worshiping. It's just a love. And trust me, no one can love Jesus's mother more than Jesus does. Right. So, you know, and that's the way I always look at it. And look at it like this. We call God the Father, right? He's our Father. We, you know, the body of Christ, we call each other's brothers and sisters. Jesus, you know, God is the Father of Jesus. Mary's the mother of Jesus. So if we are brothers in Christ and God is our Father, wouldn't, that, wouldn't it be okay for Mary to be the mother? You know, and yeah. if and it's not you a were divine. a kid and you needed help, did you not go to your mom? Exactly. You know, and and also in the in the in the prayer in the Hail Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. That's how Gabriel, you know, that's how he introduced himself. That's why he said to Mary when when he came to tell her that she was going to conceive the Son of God. And you know, it it kind of struck her as odd, like, why is he greeting me in this way? And then she goes and talks yeah, to her. She was with wonder. She yeah. just wondered, you know, and it's funny because it's like when you look at when uh, the, when Gabriel came to uh, Elizabeth's husband, you know, he says, how could this be? And he gets accursed for it. You know, it's it like, you're going to be silent. And like with Mary, it's like, how could this be? And he's like, you know, hail Mary, full of grace. If you look in the, the, the original textual documents of that, that means full of it means room for no more right right Love that. is it, it doesn't mean that mary's not a creature or that she's divine it's just that if you were god and you were able to design your earthly mother wouldn't you make her pretty cool yeah i would yeah. that's perfect mm -hmm. man yeah and and, and when know, elizabeth she, meets her elizabeth it's, says it's, the same thing and blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb jesus and elizabeth says this to her and that's the three fourths of the Hail Mary prayer, you know. And then all you do is you ask Mary, you know, to pray for us too. Yeah, there's another little about tidbit. It. Uh, you know, in in the gospel story, when Elizabeth goes on to say, "Why am I blessed that the the mother of my Lord should yes come to me?" 
David said the same thing about the ark when the ark was brought to him. That the reason why that part was specifically in the gospel written down was for us to see that the ark went from being something uh, we couldn't look at, um, you know, we couldn't touch um, to this piece of purity of gold to a human woman who represented the same thing. Yes. You know, but something that we can actually interact with now. Yes. And not be, uh, you know, he wanted to invite us into that, into his family, into everything, share everything, you know. And I think that that is what, what, what has led me to even closer to the Gospels since I have, you know, and it's like, I think like everyone, you know, they have their own thing. To me, it's like, I like the fullness, you know, I like, I, I, I could just, uh, you know, Christ is enough, but if he wants me to experience other things, then I'm going to let those things in and, and, and see what it's all about. And since I did, I'm like, man, there's nothing evil going on here. Like, what am I being told? So, you know, to anyone out there, like I said, this, this, there, there's another part too. Then when, uh, you know, uh, Elizabeth says, you know, why she come to me? That's David converted to the art. Um, uh, the, you know, that stuff is in the Bible. So just like go look at the correlation. I was just like too afraid. I was like, like subconsciously, like I was like, I don't, I don't even want Catholicism. Like I don't want anything to do with it. Like I don't care. And when I started actually, oh, oh, oh you know, like, I'll, I'll, I'll just see what they have to say kind of thing. Because, like, it seems like it was like, I'll, I'll give you a political example. Okay. I'm not going to get into political leanings in any way. But one thing I'll, I'll tell you is that one thing I noticed was, like, there were certain characters that the media would talk about. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah. So that must be true. And then when it's like, I'd see what they actually said. I'd be like, wait a minute. I just listened to what they said. That's not what they said. You know, it was the same thing with the Catholic Church. They were like, Catholics do this, they do that, they do this, they do that. And then when I was like, well, what did they actually say and do? And I went and looked at what they said. Why well, is it not mind? Not right. true. <laughs> right. That's it. <laughs> just kind of shocked at that eye. And I was like, you know, so now I'm in the process of being received into the church. I'm not even technically fully Catholic yet. Right. I I was I was I was baptized Catholic. I was did my first communion as Catholic, my first yeah. confession as Catholic. Yeah. Never did get confirmation in the church where the bishop lays hands on you. you yeah. Know? I, um, same, I was in the same spot, man. I got I got to the same yeah. spot, and that's that's when I was a teenager. And I was like, well, it's pretty common, you know. So I'm yeah. in the process of doing it now, and it's just funny because like with all of it, it sounds so. Uh, arrogant but with all the the, the, the looking into things i've been doing and, and reading the church fathers and everything it's like i'm going through the confirmation program that's sort of like seven years old seven year olds but like <sighs> man this is the process i gotta go through it you know that's it. That's um, it. but it should be now the middle of january and i'll be able to uh to participate in all sacraments of the church so in the meantime, I'm making rosaries and trying to get them out to as many places as I can. I just want them. I just like, I, I love sharing the love of it. It's helped me so much. It, I've heard of so many testimonies of helping with addictions and, yeah. you know, anxieties and worries. I'm telling mm -hmm. you, if you've never tried it, just give it a try. What do you got to lose? You're not praying to Mary. Don't worry about it. All you're doing is rehearsing scripture lines. <laughs> Hey, let me give you one more too, man. And this is the last thing I had to to correlate or to ask or whatever. Um, I know we've been on here for a while and I can smell lunch downstairs. <laughs> uh, this Bell Island, and this is another one. And I'm not, I'm not stretching here. I'm not reaching guys, but it, it always <clears throat> seems to come back to one thing. There's a woman in white story with Bell Island, right? Yes. Okay, and uh, this this 
is probably not a good woman in white, I would imagine. No, it's kind of a sad woman in white. And, yeah. and my dad has actually seen her. There you go. Uh, um, now this this uh, a woman in white, I'm not saying it's the same one, but a woman in white is often attributed to Lilith, who is the uh, opposite of Mother Mary. Uh, she's the queen of demons, where Mary is the mother of God. Uh, it's just a perversion. It's just the inversion of what's good. And so it's just like, no matter where I go or what I talk about, here is some kind of other symbol. So this mother, this woman in white, uh, what, what's her story? man? So the story comes from, it's actually one of the, you know, there's, there's so much history and so much lore. It's one of the more later ones that comes from the war times. Um, so the story goes that uh, there was a young woman who lived in the area. Uh, I, I don't have, you can find this story. Uh, anyone can on, uh, you know, somewhere on the internet if you really want to get the good details to it. It was on an episode of Creepy Canada at one point, I do believe. Um, but essentially, during the wartime, there was Nazi sympathizers, uh, people who were, I guess, German of origin uh, that lived on the island, who were there before, I guess, the war broke out. So U-boats mm -hmm. would come and dock secretly in the nighttime and the guys would get off the boats and go get supplies and whatnot from these Nazi sympathizers and load them back on the U-boats. So the story goes that there was a young woman who couldn't sleep one night or whatever, or she was coming home from somewhere. I don't know the deal. She was out walking and happened to see this going on. Uh, I can't remember if it was in Dobbin's Garden or Butler's Marsh. Uh, but they're supposed to be the two of the most haunted places on the island. She she saw the Germans. They knew she seen them. So they chased after her, um, and they stuck her head face down in the swamp and drowned her, murdered her. Um, and the story goes that any men in the area and, and you know the whole island really. Uh, who are, say, not the men that don't treat women well, will usually become victim. And uh, the story goes that she'll, when she shows up, all you can smell is like rotten eggs and a terrible stench. At first, she seems like a beautiful woman. You know, and when, as she gets closer, she turns into this hag mm. on the creature um, that's just filled with pure hate for men and uh, smells like the, the swamp gases that she was drowned in. So she apparently suffocates you, right, with these gases. So she says, now you'll see what I felt. Um, but I have a little one here of my dad, actually. My dad told me when he was, he was in high school, it would have been around grade nine or 10. They used to have these dances. Um, St. Kevin's School. Uh, locals will know that, I guess. Um, and he's giving me details here of like where it even was. Some of these places, I don't even know where it is, but locals in Bell Island would know. Uh, so he was leaving the, the teen center with a couple friends, uh, going home up Compressor Hill by the old fire station. When they saw it come out from behind it, uh, a white floating human shape cloud-like entity mm. so like female-esque because it almost looked like a dress type thing maybe a night dress but but for like not formless uh faceless but not you know formed like a like a woman but faceless right. and she seemed to float in front of them that's probably about 60 feet if you were to guess he's like it's a long time ago you know and it seemed that uh, she took interest in them for a second and then disappeared. And what he seems to, what he was always told by my grandparents and whatnot was that where they were younger boys, like 15, she had no beef with them. 
you know, so she's like, these are just kids. I'm not going to tear. I only terrorize men who abuse women and stuff. But yeah, that's how the story goes wow. of the woman in white. But it seems like it was this poor, innocent girl that was, you know, had something horrible done to her. But it's like the way it's like the story doesn't go into this nice uh, justice. It's this terror, havoc wreaking entity, this this evil entity. So it seems like I don't know, maybe as as she was dying, she was maybe like, oh, if I could only get revenge, you know, and right. called upon some kind of thing that allowed her to tear out. I, I don't know. I, 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 spirits are one of the biggest things for me that I have problems with because right. they're, they're the hardest things to fit in the Christian worldview, although they're in the Bible. And they why are. not? But it's, but it's like, what do you do with them exactly? Right. It's like because like it's like they must be like why aren't they in Sheol? Or you know, it's like I, I still got figuring out to do. But yeah, yep. we all you know, do that's, that's makes the, it so fun, man. You know, yeah, and that's what keeps that mystery alive. It's, it's it seems to be really popping off now too. You you got a lot of uh, people in and people call it I think because there's so many people that dismiss it. It's like okay, uh scary stories and stuff of fairies and all this stuff it doesn't fit in with the christian worldview therefore it just must not be true so i'm not going to bother with it right and when you really think about it it's like no no, no what what are, what are your uncles seeing and, and billy down the road and you know this stuff happens all the time there's no way all these people are making this up i always go by the dr heiser thing you know like even if one even That's if it. one is true, and we know just even statistically probably that out of all the folklore stories told in the history of humanity, one is true, has to be. So, you know, I believe almost probably everyone because I'm just a believer. You know? I'm, too, like, I'm like I'm like the uh, mold around the X-Files, you know? <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's why I have to be careful, and I, I, I truly try to keep a skepticism, you know? I try to, to do the 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 Jimmy Aiken kind of approach where it's like from faith and reason, you know, and like sometimes that lines up and then other times it's like, uh, they're, they're too far apart to, uh, make sense. Therefore it must be a mystery. It must be something of faith, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can ramble on all day about the paranormal. That is the main, the main core of, of of what I have though, um, I love but it. as for stories that uh, uh, happen to family members and stuff, like I said, my my nan is is the one that it's like those are the ones that scare me. Oh yeah, those are the ones that scare me. You know, yeah, but yeah, when you get stories like that from honest people, that you know you can hang your hat on that man. It's 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 the source, right? It's the source. Yes. All right, Adam. I appreciate you for coming on, man, and sharing everything. Uh, you gave me a lot to research on with this Bell Island too. I I love that kind of stuff. I'm going to go downstairs and look up documentaries and see if I can spend the day watching that. Um, <clears throat> please tell everybody where they can find you and get one of these rosaries. I hope everybody. I hope you get like so flooded with emails and orders that. <laughs> Yeah, you have to go back to the the craft store and buy some more. Uh, that wouldn't be I, bad. That wouldn't be bad. That would be that would be wonderful. Uh, it, but even if you get one or two orders, I'll be happy that you know we could direct people to you to get something that blesses them right back. Yeah, just tell them where yes, they can find you. At. Sure. So you can find us at uh, Stone Rosary Co. Uh, just on Facebook. You type that in, you'll find us. Um, we have a website, www.stonerosaryco.ca, because we're in Canada. Um, if you're in the United States, we can get it to you there about 10 days or so. Um, you can like us on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, like I said, we take half our proceeds, and we're thinking of doing it to the food bank again this year, although it may be something like the Single Parents Association we haven't decided yet. Um, but, uh, yeah, stonerosaryco.ca, um, 
and forgive us for the website. We don't update it as often as we should. We're, we're both working full time. So if you really want to have a good look at our rosaries, just reach out a Facebook message to the page and like, I'll chat with you. I'll tell you what colors we have, what styles, if you have a favorite saint or color or, or whatever. If you've seen something you liked a combination of on the website, we'll make it fully custom if you want. Um, but yeah, so reach out to us on our Facebook page and uh, you can always find us there. Amen. Perfect. Awesome, man. Well, thank you again. Uh, also, if people want to hear more of you, you were on Blurry Creatures, right? It was a members only episode, number one thirteen. Is that what you said? Yeah, I believe it was one thirteen. Um, like I said, uh, anyone that will have to forgive me, uh, any details that are uh, have been updated in this episode and the story of uh, my nan meeting the devil. So uh, this is the most accurate according to my family <laughs> history. Uh, so forgive me if there's a you know some small on or off but uh yeah you find me there and that's what that's about it really um i just like to uh uh you know keep them keep the stories out there so that if god forbid anything ever happened to me or or whatever before i got a, a chance to tell them to my daughter that, that they're out there and you know it continues on. I know my cousins know them and stuff, but I don't know, you know, if they paid much as much attention to those as, as I have. Right. Um, so uh, it's always been a fascination of mine. So, um, yeah, that's about it. Really, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, and God bless, man. I hope all the best for you and all the listeners. Um, yeah, reach out if you want a rosary. And even if, you know what, if, you, if you're someone who's, you know, you're, you're struggling with, with addiction or, or, or anything like that, and, and you can't afford one at the moment, but, but you need one. And, and I, I can, you know, sense that you're, you're being genuine about it. I'll make you one and send it. You know, I just want people to have the peace, you know, at the end of the day. Brother, so, you have a heart of gold. You know that you... Wonderful man. Wonderful man of God. I appreciate you saying that, but it's only because of the, this, this right here. That's right. That's not all, the reason. all about Jesus, baby. <laughs> all oh, right. That's right. Not everyone can see. So I was, I was holding <laughs> the crucifix if, if anyone's <laughs> on. <laughs> all right, man. Well, God bless you and yours. And uh, holler at me on Facebook later, man. Let's chat. All right. You too, man. Have a good one. All right. God bless. Peace and love. God bless.